Can you hear me okay? All right, even in the back. Wow, good crowd. Um, it's great to be here, guys. Um, we've obviously heard uh, a lot today uh, about the future of work, and we're going to be talking here primarily about knowledge work, but we'll get into some other things. Um, we've seen a lot of change in the way that careers are conceived, uh, in the way that gigs are taken, uh, in the ways that small businesses uh, can run with new kinds of tools. And I want the panelists here to just tell you a little bit about their position relative to all this change uh, in work. So a little bit of background. Um, let's go first to Catherine here. Tell us about your company and sort of your relationship to this issue. Great, absolutely. So um, my name is Catherine Minshew, and uh, six years ago, I founded a company called The Muse that now helps over 50 million people, most of them millennials, navigate their careers. So um, we help people find jobs, upskill for jobs, speak to a career coach, take a class, anything they need to get where they want to go professionally. And then on the flip side of that, we have about 700 partners, um, some of the world's biggest businesses, as well as actually several of, uh, of the very smallest um, technology companies like a like a Facebook, as well as um, the Capital Ones, Goldman Sachs, and, and others of the world. And so we see the sort of changing nature of work from both sides. Um, I'm, I'm totally fascinated. I actually started the business because of what I saw as a massive gap on the individual uh, career seeker side. But I've spent a lot of the last six years working with companies and thinking about what their needs are and how that matches, or, or in some cases mismatches, what, uh, what we're seeing in the talent pool. And Jim, obviously co-founder of Square, um, as well as of a nonprofit called Launch Code. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the kind of two sides of uh, the work world that you've seen, both the kind of small business, solo entrepreneur, as enabled by new tech tools, as well as uh, you know, kind of someone getting into the industry in an, in an unusual way through Launch Code. So we obviously see millions of small businesses every day at Square, and it's very empowering to you know have the ability to get paid. So that was the first problem we were trying to solve. Um, when Square launched, we opened an office in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, and it was a technical office. And what I noticed was that every time I would hire a new engineer, I would get an irate phone call from some CEO or CIO who would say, Jim, why'd you take Sally or something? You know, it, it gets very personal. Um, <laughs> and Jack, my co-founder, is also a St. Louisan, and so we decided... Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey, yeah. So um, we shut the office. Um, because we didn't want to be the jerks that were hiring away all the talent in town. Um, and at the time, tech talent in my hometown was a zero-sum game. Uh, there were enough people graduating and coming into the workforce just to replace the ones who were leaving. But when a company like Boeing would get a new contract, they'd just raid Centene or Monsanto or some other place. So, um, so it was a disaster. Uh, and then... Um, after a few years of watching that, I decided to try to do something about that. And the idea for Launch Code was to reverse the process. So typically, talent shortages are addressed by education. That's the normal move, right? So if you need people who can operate lathes, well, you, let's teach people how to run, run a lathe. Turns out that doesn't work in programming um, for a bunch of reasons. But uh, what we tried to do was invert it. So we said, well, we could start with employment because there was a trick to programming that I'm not as sure applies in all other businesses, but it, it, is, it is essentially learned on the job. So if you can just get the job and hold it for six months, then you can go work anywhere. So what we and that's because the programming languages and the frameworks that people are using are changing often enough yes. that they... They change so fast, and the nature of the work is such that even people with university degrees um, uh, don't have a distinct advantage over people who are really well self-taught. Um, so what we did was we came up with a curriculum um, uh, that was able to get people very, very quickly from zero programming experience to employed full-time. And then we figured out how to make that free. So we can now offer free training to, well, basically anyone, um, and uh, it results in real jobs. And these are market rate jobs. These are not like pity jobs. These are, we need you today, get your ass in here, jobs. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of, uh, of a career. Um, I think a lot of the 
you know, just kind of atmospherics around millennials' relationship to work. Um, it's just that they're not interested in a career, necessarily. Um, is that what you have been finding? Or are you finding that it's more we've been telling them you don't get to have a career, um, rather than them not wanting that kind of long-term engagement with an industry? Yeah, it's interesting. We, we see um, some some elements of the opposite, which is that when we use words like jobs with our community, they're they're less interested. And when we talk about careers, um, you see that that engagement. And I do think um, this is not to be confused necessarily with obviously a lot of ink has been spilled on the gig economy, and, and we certainly feel the effects of that at the Muse. But interestingly, a lot of our users use uh, side gigs, use um, you know various uh, short-term work opportunities as a way to transition between two different careers um, or to give themselves some space to figure out what they really want before diving back into it uh, or to test something on the side that they think might be an interesting opportunity. And so, you know, when I when I look at the millennial demo, what I think is interesting, there was a study recently that came out um, with, I believe, Wells Fargo that 94% of millennials uh, value meaningful work uh, and meaning in work. There was a Deloitte millennial study that said 44% of millennials had turned down a job because they didn't um, believe the organization aligned with their values values. I mean, there's a much more um, values-driven, purpose-driven, intentional approach to careers. And um, I think it's having fascinating implications, especially on the, the, um, the types of roles that are really hard to hire for, the developer roles, the sales roles, where companies are, are starting to compete and to be held accountable for certain things by their employee populations. And uh, it's, a, it's a brave new world, but I, I think it can be a really good one. So, you know, the title of our panel is Who Wins in the Future of Work? Um, and I think the, the default would be that the same groups that have traditionally won uh, will, will continue to win, um, unless there's some sort of transformative change um, that, that occurs. Do you think things like launch code or broader kinds of changes are, are actually going to lead to new winners as opposed to traditional educated upper socioeconomic groups uh, continuing to sort of get the jobs that their parents, a similar type of jobs that their parents had in terms of income? Well, I mean, look, yeah, things are really changing, but the question is how does one take advantage of that change and how does one make decisions based on sort of new opportunities? So the, the greatest thing we've seen is uh, the fact that the campus has become irrelevant. Um, you know, in the old days, when you had to have individual experts so we have what, 200, 300 people here? I'm sorry, we're in Washington. We have a million people here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but of you, like that's, the only, that's how many people could fit in this room. Okay, so if we were normally having a class, you would have one lecturer and, you know, the million people, right? Um, and that naturally creates the campus environment, which is why you have universities. You have these individual experts. Well, these days, that whole model has been just sort of upended by the fact that we can take the greatest teachers in each discipline, um, record them, uh, come up with supplementary material, and del deliver that remotely anywhere. So one of the interesting things that, uh, that Harvard did was Harvard worked with edX, and edX has made just mountains of phenomenal education available online for free. And um, for instance, when uh, the Greek and Spanish economies were crashing, uh, you could see the spike in usage in those economies. And it's sort of interesting to think that you may have this system in the future where pockets of poverty or pockets of deprivation or pockets of, of problems, like if you, you're, you're, you know, your currency just is destroyed, they could be the next winners because their population, if they choose to, can then go back and get re-educated. Uh, sort of like why the third world has the best uh, cell phone coverage. I, but, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just say I want to also add on to something you said earlier, which is that in many forms of technology today, the individual who you know is learning it on the job now can uh, compete on the same playing field with, or in some cases, um, you know kind of best the person who has that fancy degree. And I do think that is, to your original question, one of the ways in which um, a new class of people can win. Now, it doesn't mean it's predetermined that the winners will be different. It, it does not. But we're seeing, um, and, and 
engineering has the tightest cycle in terms of what's changing and how quickly it's being adopted. But across a number of the different industries that the Muse serves, we're seeing the tools people use, the expectations for how you do your job, what that means are being rewritten and upended. And I think that gives a huge advantage to people who have a mindset and some sort of capacity for continuous learning, as opposed to saying, I went to a, a great school, I have my degree, and I'm done. And um, it's still early days for this, but I do think that um, the combination of some of this access to great education and content online, combined with the pace of change, means that there are opportunities for people with um, less credentialed or, or, frankly, backgrounds with no credentials at all to step in and have a, a really important part to play. One thing I wanted to ask you both about is it oftentimes when we talk about people getting into careers, we talk about um, education, we're talking about like younger people kind of coming into the field. But a lot of the most heartbreaking stories, particularly in knowledge work, I think, are people who are on, you know, kind of the middle or towards the end of their careers, who've kind of done everything they were supposed to do, they've gone up the corporate ladder, but then they find that they're like too expensive and they're like replaced by somebody sort of at the bottom of the ladder. Yeah, or a robot. Or a robot, or a robot, yeah. Um, which we're, we should talk about briefly too. Um, what the kind last of, panel, I think. What kind of answers are you, are you seeing for, for people like that who find themselves in that situation? So we just placed a guy in his 70s. Um, I was literally on a hayride at Cub Scout camp this weekend and the lady sitting next to me in, on the hayride said, oh, thank you, I just went through launch code and got a new job, and she was easily in her 40s. Um, and um, look, uh, speaking of someone who's never really had a career, um, uh, don't count on a multi-decade employment tenure with one company. Um, that's just not the way things are done these days. So the ability to quickly retrain, and then also the ability to get um, j to d just get the chance. So the trick that we use at Launch Code, which is really sort of devious, is we tell the employers, look, you don't have to keep this person. You can fire her the next day, you know? So just give poor old Catherine a try, right? And, and she'll come in, and, and if you hate her, just... So, so as soon as I let them know that they can just can this person immediately, they're more open to giving them a, a, a chance. And then, you know, 90% of the time they keep them anyway, so congratulations, there's your career. You know, do you, either of you see, uh, or w what role do you see for, for workers themselves sort of organizing in various ways? I mean, do you see interest from that in the, in the Muse community of, you know, unions or other types of sort of worker organization? Um, you know, we don't, I'm not sure that our platform would pick up on those conversations. We do see a tremendous sense of um, desire to share knowledge, share insight, um, but I think that it's, you know, it's an interesting time politically in terms of what we're seeing. Um, this is a little bit different, but um, I'll just tell a, a story without the company attached. One of our uh, partners, a, a very, very large, well-known uh, Fortune 100, you know, we get on a call uh, a couple weeks ago. And he's like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, I got a new blender. Life's good. You know, how's it going for you? And he's like, oh, I've spent the last three days in... Um, in back-to-back -back meetings over uh, employee groups that are coming forward to demand our business takes a stand on a certain political issue. And it's been fascinating for us. Affinity see, groups. Yes. Yeah. Um, affinity groups as well as larger groups of um, employees that were perhaps unconnected previous to this cause um, arising in, in the media and the political sphere. And suddenly, these groups of employees were standing up and saying, I believe in this organization and I want to be part of it, but you need to act in this way. And it was creating tremendous and, and honestly really fascinating um, pressure. And, and I think the implications of that on the C-suite, uh, the, the executive group, it had consumed you know, a huge part of this company's week and they ended up taking action in a major way and it was, it was part of a story that then played out uh, in the newspapers. But I think um, it's, in some ways it's very unprecedented the role that many employees expect to play within their companies. And it's less, at least from my perspective, uh, it's less about some of the, f the, the union style organizing, but more about uh, defining a position and then inserting their collective will um, to communicate that to management. And do you have advice for companies whose employees are organizing in that way? Um, firstly, I think that uh, open and honest engagement is really important because um, 
you know, you could, you could point to a lot of causes for this, but people's BS detectors are very, very high. And uh, this is particularly true of millennials, but you know, interestingly to, to the question earlier about, uh, about demographics, when I started the company, I assumed that this platform would be for people early in their career, getting started, moving up. And in fact, a fairly substantial percentage of our users are much, much more experienced, but looking for either a reset, a restart to, to change something. Um, and so I think when you look at the um, at companies that are engaging with this sort of advocacy, it's about sitting down and understanding what are people's concerns. Um, if it's appropriate, sometimes explaining why different employee groups believe in different ways, and therefore this is why you're going to, to act. But I also think that um, we're living in an age in which people will vote with their feet if they feel uh, that their values are becoming fundamentally misaligned. And I think that, again, I think it's going to be really interesting um, to see how companies react to that in the next few years. Um, one last gear change before we go uh, to questions, so get your questions ready. Um, do you think in the near term, let's define near term here as about 10 years, um, how much do you think artificial intelligence and its various manifestations will uh, change what you both do? So I think AI is already having a pretty profound impact. Um, it's seen at the edges now. Uh, but it's so pervasive, and the machines are so good, and they learn so quickly. Um, we use it to detect fraud at Square. We use it, um, it, it just in a, in a host of ways to just sort of make life better. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, don't predict 10 years in tech, ever. You know, quantum computing is already freaking out the Bitcoin guys, right? Because they're like, oh, it's unbreakable, except if we've got qubits, you know? And so, um, <laughs> you know, so, so I wouldn't make a 10 year call, but it's definitely gonna be a profound change. Um, so, you know, have fun with that. What, what I'll say that I, I think is going to be really interesting, and, and maybe we'll, we'll call this a three-year prediction. Uh, feel free to, to, to hold me to it if I'm wrong. But, um, you know, I, I think that within particularly, let's look at sort of the, the career and HR space, that AI has the potential to um, free up a lot of recruiters and HR professionals from some of the more mundane tasks. But interestingly, what, I, what we're hearing consistently across the board from, from talent um, is that they want relationships over transactions. And that means when companies get really excited, we're going to, you know, introduce a bot to replace like a certain recruiting process. Um, great talent does not want to speak to a bot. They want to speak to a human at your company and be treated as a human in return. And so I think the most effective uses of AI are going to be in ways that supplement either things that humans can't do, so detecting fraud uh, at large scale, um, or in, in aiding people to actually deliver more human and personalized interactions because some of the... Um, some of the, the things that are less critical that a human does are taken away. I do think, though, it's really important that as we're thinking about the implications of AI, we keep in mind that we have to build the right um, guardrails into these systems because you, know, you can very easily create uh, algorithms to screen resumes, but if those algorithms follow human uh, biases in terms of race and gender types of names, you're going to end up with perhaps an even worse situation than the one that we're in today. All right, let's take some questions. Thanks so much. My name is Andrew. I, uh, I run a HR and recruiting practice here in DC, a small business that I just started myself. And um, you guys talked a lot about this change to education and change to this new work environment. My question for you is we're here in the nation's capital where a lot of work is tied to a government contract, which is tied to clearances, which is tied to service level agreements and really specific requirements for placing somebody. So have you given thought to how that will how we can bring the change we're seeing in the private sector into federal and help people uh, have that same flexibility within the federal workforce. I think they've got to simplify government contracting. Um, sorry. Um, uh, so as somebody who's, you know, sort of had companies to apply for different parts of the uh, government uh, dole, um, it's Byzantine and it favors large companies. And if you have that dynamic, you're naturally gonna have these very, very large, inflexible companies. If you can simplify the process, uh, and the open government initiatives are a good step towards that, then naturally you're gonna see more entrepreneurship enter in. Because the government needs efficiency just like anybody else. 
Um, the problem with the government is that you can get burned for wasting a dollar. But if it costs you $10 to put up the guardrails to not misspend that $1, then that's an inefficiency in the economy. So we really want to see, hopefully, uh, some more of the open government. And hopefully that will help. Hi, I'm Daniela Kemrath. I'm an um, entrepreneur. My question is, uh, you've talked about millennials. I want to talk about the brothers and sisters, the older brothers, sisters, and millennials. What do you do with that wealth of talent if you don't want to be hired just for one or two days, as you joked earlier? Because I, I've, I've seen that. I'm new to this country. I've been here two years and a half. And because I've been an entrepreneur all my life, sending my CV, I've been told, lady, you're really overqualified for no, so many jobs. No, they're saying you're old. Um, <laughs> well, it is the number one bias we face. So um, at Launch Code, we, we see these phenomenal demographics across all these you know, thousands of people that we're working with. And um, the number one bias today in tech is age. OK? And then you can get into race and gender and all this other stuff. But age is the number one thing. Um, and we've placed people, you know, we routinely place people in their 40s, 50s. Our oldest placement was in his 70s. We got them a programming job, a coding job. The, you know, the first digit starts with a seven. Yes. You know. <laughs> the trick to getting rid of bias is need. So one of the things that makes launch code sort of easy to run is that there is so much demand for the coding skills that we teach. Uh, that they don't care if you come in with two artificial knees, you know. <laughs> so it's really been uh, very gratifying to just sort of look past this. And, and we send out candidates, and we don't talk demographics at all. We just ignore it completely. And it turns out if the demand is there sufficiently, uh, the employers look right past it. Ironically, I should add one other thing. The people that we place that are older, um, tend to get sucked into management positions almost immediately. <laughs> They're not particularly valued for their programming skills after six months, but they get brought into running teams of people who program. It's, it's a fantastic trick. So, yeah. I'll also just add quickly, we, uh, we actually have a, a fairly substantial body of content um, about this on the Muse because we see a lot of people who are dealing with right now. It, it is a very... Um, frustrating and pervasive bias in a lot of hiring. And I think one of the things that's also can be very uh, useful is figuring out what are the most likely concerns on the other side of the table and can you proactively address them in some way? Um, because it's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a version of what we see with millennials, which is that if people have an expectation that someone's entitled, how do you go into an interview and help demonstrate that that's not the mindset you have? Um, and we don't have a lot of time to get into the specifics, maybe we can talk afterwards, but there are some, um, things that you can do with uh, other biases people might have that will at least help minimize the chance that they're going to put you in a bucket that's not accurate to who you are and what you bring as an individual. Probably last question. I've actually got my okay. Am I seeing a mic or am I not oh. seeing a mic? Oh. Sorry, you sort of addressed it in uh, the last question, but I guess I wonder about the Muse, and you have spoken specifically about it as a millennial platform, and I'm wondering about your extending it to older populations because it seems as though, presumably as those people age them too, the kinds of questions, you know, it's, it gets to more sophisticated kinds of job seeking and job, and you know, the sort of the, the, the job seeker and job uh, recruiter dance, you know what I mean? And, and anyway, it just seems like th that kind of matching yeah. could go further. And the, the very quick answer is that um, that's something we're talking a lot about internally right now. And it's been interesting because when I started the company, we had a very specific target in mind of who we were going to help. And frankly, that target looked a lot like me. I knew I needed help. I knew people like me who knew that they, that they needed help. And as the company has grown, we found that not only have people found us that weren't in our original target demo who love the product and, and have some of the same or at least similar needs, but companies are saying, well, if I'm working the Muse and, uh, with the Muse and you're doing a great job helping me hire millennial talent, you know, I'm, we don't have a lot of time to talk about generational differences, but I think that um, in many cases they're overblown and that there's a huge opportunity for different um, generations to learn from each other and, uh, and for us to create products that speak to much larger groups of people than just one narrow slice. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you.